working in the expanded field. That term, the expanded field, have you heard this in any of your sculpture classes or uh, other, uh, any of your other art classes? The expanded field, that language, that phrase comes from a famous essay that was uh, your reading for today uh, by a theorist named Rosalind Krauss. And Rosalind Krauss is very well known in art theory, art criticism. She, uh, she helped to found the journal October, October Journal, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's a, a, a very densely written <laughs> art journal uh, that uh, is a little bit of a slog to get through, but has been very influential over the past uh, few decades, several decades. Uh, and so Rosalind Krauss is, is well known uh, for her work in that and uh, well known in, um, and in fact this essay originally appeared in October. Um, and she's also a very well known professor and she writes uh, lots of books and things like that. Um, and I want to use her essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field, from the late 70s to help us uh, understand what's happening in art making in the, in the 70s and after. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll use her essay to, to work with uh, today. So if you have that, you can take it out and we'll just sort through it a bit. Um, and she opens the essay very early on by saying this, which is a great way to kind of get things rolling. Over the last 10 years, rather surprising things have come to be called sculpture. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we saw some of those surprising things uh, last week at uh, the Geffen. Um, and we're going to see some more of these things uh, today. But uh, sculpture seems to have had its uh, definition blown out uh, at some point over the last 10 years, uh, which, by which she means the 70s, uh, during the 70s and maybe a, a, a bit before that, sculpture seems to be difficult to pin down. And so, so she goes on after this quote and says, she gives examples, narrow corridors with TV monitors at the ends, large photographs documenting country hikes, mirrors placed at strange angles in ordinary rooms, temporary lines cut into the floor of the desert. Nothing, it would seem, could possibly give to such a motley of effort the right to lay claim to whatever one might mean by the category of sculpture, unless, that is, the category can be made to become almost infinitely malleable. Uh, so uh, she starts off the essay by posing the problem, what is sculpture? Uh, what's being called sculpture today uh, doesn't abide by traditional notions, and so uh, what do we do? How do we define it? And uh, her, her solution to this is, is, uh, is, is fairly creative and uh, makes room for a lot of the artistic practice that will follow the 1970s. Um, and she has a whole, the first several pages are kind of her account of modernist sculpture and this breakdown of the traditional notion of sculpture. Um, and we're not going to go through that uh, real slowly because we have too much else to talk about. I want to get into the meat of her argument. But uh, the kind of summary is, it goes something like this, that the logic of sculpture is tied to the logic of the monument. So, so uh, she says that fairly early on. And what does she mean by that? She, uh, here's, here's a quote. She says, it sits in a particular place and speaks in a symbolical tongue about the meaning or use of that place. In other words, what has sculpture traditionally been? It's been tied to place. It has inhabited a place. And it serves a certain symbolic function in that place and in that in that site. Um, but she says with modernism, what happens is that we get this sculpture becomes sort of sightless in a way. It doesn't, it, it loses its site specificity. So traditionally you might have um, 
traditionally a sculpture, and she uses this as an example, the sculpture of Marcus Aurelius in, uh, in Rome, that is a Roman statue of a Roman emperor um, that has been reconfigured and repositioned in the context of the Renaissance uh, ruling government in Rome, and it's positioned there for the sake of the way that that thing means in relation to this site, the way that it uh, kind of uh, projects power and peaceful authority and those sort of things. Um, but she says what happens with, with modernism is that this uh, begins to erode, this logic of the monument, this logic of sculpture, um, making sense uh, in the site that it is made for and, and originally placed. Uh, and she says this, uh, that modernism gives way to, modernist sculpture gives way to a kind of sightlessness or homelessness, an absolute loss of place. Modernism reconfigures the monument into abstraction, the monument as pure marker or base, functionally placeless and largely self-referential. And what is that language? Placeless, self-referential. What other, what other artwork have we talked about where those words have been used? <laughs> Expressionism to some extent, yeah. Um, and, and if you go even further past uh, uh, abstract expressionism, that sort of self-referentiality gets pushed even further into uh, minimalism, right? And so she argues that in, in abstract expressionist uh, sculpture and then into minimalist sculpture, you get this emphasis on placelessness, self-referentiality. It doesn't refer to the uh, area around it, it just refers to itself, and that leads to a kind of placelessness, sightlessness or homelessness, as she says. It is these two characteristics of modernist sculpture that declare its status, and therefore its meaning and function, as essentially nomadic. Okay, uh, we won't get too hung up uh, in all of this, but basically she says that the sculpture absorbs its pedestal and just becomes an object in space, and that object in space can be moved to any given place because it's not tied to a place. The modernist cube isn't tied to a place. It belongs anywhere and can be imposed anywhere. Um, and she is uh, worried about the way that that causes a kind of de-emphasis of place and of sight. And one can certainly see how she arrives at that conclusion or that argument, that these can go anywhere, and in fact, the place that they are best suited for is the museum where there's not where the context is purposefully de-emphasized. Um, it's supposed to be as neutral as possible, right? If you go into a museum, you're not supposed to pay attention to the walls or the floor. You're supposed to be as close to a non-space as, as possible, right? And that's where uh, minimalism and um, modernist sculpture in general it belongs, I, I think, uh, she might say. Um, and so she concludes that by the early 1960s, and you should think with that minimalism, by the early 1960s, with minimalism, sculpture had entered into a categorical no man's land. It was what was on or in front of a building that was not the building, or what was in the landscape that was not the landscape. It didn't function as, a, as an object specifically situated um, and it became, with minimalism, these sort of uh, objects that were kind of, uh, they were kind of, in some ways, indistinguishable from the room, I guess you could say. So in, in this, where is the art? Well, it's, it's the stuff that is in the room, but it's not part of the room, or it's in the landscape, but it's not part of the landscape. Um, it's not permanently positioned there, and 
uh, it's, it's somewhat, I don't know, uh, in some ways it's only a distinguish, like this piece in the corner. What is that? Is that the art? How do you know that's the art and the wall isn't the art? Well, because that, even though it kind of fits into the structure, is not part of the structure, the original structure. <laughs> um, and, and this is an interesting uh, a, a kind of argument that she brings up. Um, because whereas the minimalists talk about, I mean, the minimalists talk about their work as being a pure presences and uh, uh, what, uh, specific objects in literal space and those sort of things. That's how they talked about it. Krauss seems to want to read them as being, uh, I don't know that they are, uh, that they are pure presences in literal space, specific objects, but that they become uh, disjointed, uh, they have a disjointed relationship to their space, and they become kind of not fully present in a way. They're not integrated into the place that they are, the space that they are. They're just intended to uh, be moved around from place to place and, um, and become sightless in a way. Does that, are you, are you kind of tracking with her argument there a, a bit? It gets, a, it gets a little difficult, and I think she makes a few sleight of hand moves there, and I think I've echoed her in making some of those sleight of hand <laughs> moves in, this, uh, in, in the way that I'm presenting it, um, because she's emphasizing the sightlessness, and then she gets to the place where she says, by the 60s, the work says, or the work becomes essentially that which is in the room that's not part of the room, or uh, that which is in the landscape that's not part of the landscape. And that's going to be the, the move that she uses to uh, sort out the rest of the essay. And, and this is an example she gives, uh, Robert Morris's Mirrored Cubes, where what is this work? When you look at the work itself, all you see is more of the room. Um, so what is the work? Well, it's, it's the thing that's in the room that's not part of the room. But really, when you look at it, all you see is the room, in a sense, and because, because it's mirrored. And she calls these forms which are distinct from the setting only because, though visually continuous with the setting or the landscape, they are not, in fact, part of the landscape or part of the room. OK. Uh, so I think her, her conclusion or her thesis here, uh, before she launches into the meat of the paper, the conclusion or the, the, the thesis here is this, um, that sculpture had entered the full condition of its inverse logic and had become pure negativity, the combination of, uh, of exclusions, the not landscape and the not architecture. Okay, that's sort of wordy, um, but Essentially, what she's arguing is that um, in modernist sculpture, it goes so far and blows out the definition so much that uh, what is sculpture now by the 1960s? It's the thing in the landscape that's not part of the landscape. And it's the thing in the architecture that's not really part of the architecture. That's what sculpture has become. But th what that means is that it's become a negative thing. You're only defining it negatively. Is that, does that make sense? Where at, by the 60s, you can't get to the place, or you no longer have the uh, ability to define sculpture in a neat way and say sculpture is this, this, this. These are the qualities of sculpture. Because all of those have been withheld, for the most part, by the minimalists. It's not necessarily tied to a place. It's not necessarily representational. It's not necessarily this or that. It's, we are defining it pretty much negatively by now. OK, this is the basis on which she will um, kind of put forth her theory of the expanded field. Any, any questions up to this point? I know that's a little murky, but any, any particular responses or questions? OK, we'll, we'll see if it becomes clear and <laughs> not so wordy uh, 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 as we go forward. 
She starts drawing diagrams in this essay, which are very helpful. I think we'd all be totally lost if she didn't start including diagrams in this essay. And she basically, uh, her first diagram is this. By the 1960s, in the, um, in the wake of, or at the height of modernist sculpture, maybe the wake of it, I don't know. Um, uh, she's saying, her thesis is that sculpture is being defined as not landscape and not architecture. Whatever is sort of in between those is sculpture. And this presents a lot of opportunities. She says this, what began to happen in the career of one sculptor after another, beginning at the end of the 1960s, is that attention began to focus on the outer limits of those terms of exclusion. So it's in the landscape, but not the landscape. That's the term of exclusion. It's in the architecture, but it's not the architecture. Uh, another term of exclusion. What happened, what she argues is that at the um, end of the 60s, that artists start to say, well, if this is what sculpture is, then what about, what, what are other possibilities for this? What if we make work that is part of the architecture, but not part of the architecture? Or is part of the landscape and not the landscape? Or could we make work that is simultaneously landscape and architecture? <laughs> And so what she does is she takes this and she says, this, this is how we're defining sculpture, but really we can open up these terms of exclusion, as she calls them, into a field. Something like this is what she draws out and what she suggests. That if we're defining sculpture in the 60s as not landscape, not architecture, but in the landscape and in the, uh, the architecture, then in theory, you could pose uh, opposites uh, of these. You could, you could open this up into other, other forms of conceivable forms of work where you make sculpture, for instance, out of the landscape. What happens if you go to a site and you, uh, you dig a hole and the hole is the artwork? Well, that, that is the landscape in a very real way. Uh, in a way unlike w how minimalist sculpture was um, functioning, where it was like, you know, this object that's in the landscape, but it's not part of the landscape. You could potentially make work out of the landscape. And likewise, you could potentially make work out of the architecture, where it was integrated into the architecture. Her problem, and what, and what she kind of poses in this essay, is what do we call those? What are they? They start happening in the, in the 70s, and that's what she's referring to when she says, there's a lot of weird stuff, surprising things that have come to be called sculpture in the last 10 years, and I don't know that we should call them sculpture, <laughs> because this is, how, this is what sculpture has, become, uh, has been called to mean. So, so what do we call these other things, these other possibilities that have arisen? Um, uh, the way she puts this is, this is this way. By means of this logical expansion, a set of binaries, meaning uh, opposites, a set of binaries is transformed into a quaternary field, a field in which you can work between these binaries or in this field. Um, which both mirrors the original position, opposition, and at the same time opens it up. And one has thereby gained the permission to think these other forms. Uh, and I think that's what she's interested in, is the way that in the 1970s, especially, um, artwork, artists grant themselves permission to really experiment with what counts as sculpture and what doesn't count as sculpture. Um, and so what are, what are we going to call this? Well, uh, last week we, or the, the last lecture, we um, started to provide some outlines for postmodernism, and that's kind of been running through the whole class. And she's going to say that this turn in sculpture from a, 
an original tight definition to a kind of more binary negative uh, definition into this field is what she's going to call po the, the, the postmodern turn in sculpture. She says this, in order to name this historical rupture and the structural transformation of the cultural field that characterizes it, one must have recourse to another term other than modernism, because this isn't modernism anymore. The one already in use in other areas of criticism is the term postmodernism. There seems no reason not to use it here. <laughs> okay, our strategy today, what we're going to do in this class uh, for the rest of this morning and this afternoon is to try to sort out and give examples for what could be these other three corners of this field that she's proposing that artists started to work in. Um, uh, and she gives names to these, uh, so we'll use her names, and uh, we'll, we'll look at specific examples and see if we can kind of uh, sort these out and understand what they mean. So she's saying that there could be work that is simultaneously landscape and architecture, and she wants to call this site construction rather than sculpture, an object that's put in the architecture or put in the landscape. Uh, so, site construction, uh, the, the possibility of making work that is simultaneously architecture and not architecture, whatever that might mean. She's going to call it axiomatic structures. We'll sort out what that means a little bit later. And then uh, the idea of uh, making work that is simultaneously landscape and not landscape, she wants to call marked sites. Okay, so we're going to take these one at a time and see if we can sort them out. What, it, what is she talking about? Uh, let's start with, uh, well, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Never mind. We just got to get into it. Uh, let's start with site construction. So um, the sort of opposite end of this field, this expanded field that sculpture can come to occupy, or whatever we're going to call this, three-dimensional work, uh, work that is simultaneously landscape and architecture, uh, site construction. We'll start with the example that she gives. She gives a couple of them, but she says this is her earliest example of a site construction. This is an artist named Robert Smithson. We'll look at more of his work later on today. Um, but this is uh, his work called Partially Buried Woodshed. <laughs> and uh, this dates back to 1970, uh, the beginning of these 10 years of surprising works that she identifies. Um, and uh, Robert Smithson did this work as a collaborative class. Uh, he had students, he, he, he visited Kent State University, um, and there was a class, I believe, or a group of students that he was collaborating with. Um, and they were talking about these sort of site constructions, the, the new possibilities for sculpture, sculpture that didn't sit in the museum. He specifically wanted to get it outside of the museum and was site specific and was integrated into the landscape rather than just imposed on it. Um, so they're talking about these things. Uh, they had some other plans for what the work was going to be. It's, it's New York, I believe. It's very cold. Um, and so they end up needing to change their idea, and they change it to this. And uh, what they do is that they uh, partially bury an existing woodshed. <laughs> this pretty uh, self-explanatory title. And they do this strategically. Um, uh, so that they take a backhoe um, and they begin to push dirt onto this woodshed that exists on the uh, campus grounds at the time but was no longer in use. They begin to push, push dirt on top of it up until the point where the structural supporting beam, the cross beam, begins to crack. And at that moment they stop. So they bury it, put, uh, impose dirt on it, put dirt on it, until this beam begins to crack, that one there. And that ceases the action. But then what happens? I mean, what happens if you crack that beam? 
the, the structure is compromised, right? Uh, at this point, it's no longer really usable or inhabitable, and the thing will probably proceed to decay and to fall in, and what he, uh, essentially what he does is he initiates an action, uh, a, a, he starts an activity or a process that will then continue to unfold over however many years. Where is the artwork? It doesn't seem to be in the woodshed, and it doesn't even seem to be in the dirt. Maybe it's in the action. It more seems to be in the idea of a compromised structure that will collapse, and the, the work is in the anticipation and <laughs> experience of, the, of its collapse, right? So obviously this is very influenced by conceptualism. Same strategy, right? Where's the work? Where's the artwork? Not in the objects, but it's in the, it's in the concept that initiates this uh, action and that uh, then carries it out. The difference between this and conceptualism is that conceptualism didn't had this really ambiguous relationship with the objects at all. Like if you remember Kosuth, Joseph Kosuth, it could be each time he installs his one and three chairs, it's totally different objects and it doesn't matter where it goes. It's totally in the concept. And these objects just uh, prompt us, initiate us into the experience of the concept. With Smithson, this is really placed. This only happens in one spot and the work is forever wedded to that spot. It's, it's a site, it's a constructed site that is simultaneously, as Krauss says, it's simultaneously the landscape and architecture, both, but it's operating in a conceptual way. The way that it, the way that it carries meaning is conceptual, but now it's, it's out of the museum, it's out of that sort of sitelessness, and is in a particular site, a particular place. So it's conceptualism that leads us into what we're going to call earthworks. Um, conceptual art strategies, art making strategies, wedded to and operating on a specific place with the materials that we inherit from the land and from culture. And he is initiating a change in them and the, the process of that change is, is where the, the concept resides. Um, and he makes sure, and this is, <laughs> uh, he makes sure that the work will carry out its full timeline um, by, before he left Kent State, he gifted the work to the university and valued it at $10,000. So uh, it couldn't, re or if it would just be changed or bulldozed, there would be all sorts of legal controversy. So he kind of works <laughs> within the legal framework to ensure that this thing is gonna run its course, and it does run its course. It does collapse, and the work begins to take on all sorts of other connotations in the context of Kent State University. Because if you know anything about Kent State, um, particularly in 1970, uh, after he had been there, uh, there was a shooting there uh, that was a hugely controversial uh, event in United States history. Um, but there are students shot during um, sort of protests, uh, and that date becomes inscribed on the woodshed itself. Some students come along, or someone come along, and inscribe the date of the shooting on this woodshed at Kent State, and the thing, the structure, then continues to collapse and continues to fall in. And so this, this event that he initiates, this process that he initiates, uh, continues over time to collapse and continues to gather all sorts of political and social associations that, of course, Smithson is not troubled by because um, the 
the unfolding of this work or the deterioration of this work over time is the point. And any uh, f way that he can speak about structures failing over time, I think he's happy to speak about. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, using uh, Krauss's language, one could see how this, what she means by site construction. It's simultaneously landscape and architecture. Neither really, I mean the two may be imposed on each other in a way, but there's not an outside object being imposed here. And she gives other examples. The second example she gives is uh, Robert Morris's uh, observatory from the following year. Um, and you've seen Robert Morris before. He's this kind of playful minimalist in the 60s, and uh, his, his work, uh, at least a good portion of it, begins to turn towards site-specific earthworks installations, where he builds this massive observatory out of wood and dirt from the site in um, Holland. And it's an observatory uh, to track the, the movements of the sun and the, the solstices. What does this remind you of? Stonehenge, yeah, I think I, I, think I heard some people say that that these, these particular artists who are doing these site constructions are looking back to ancient monumental architecture for the ways that they made sense of the world in a placed kind of way. They built structures specifically oriented towards making sense of the world, making sense of the cosmos, the stars, the sun, or making sense of the culture, I think is what Smithson would uh, be probably more interested in. Um, make sense of it by building objects out of the earth and sort of in the earth. So in a sense, even though Stonehenge is a massive undertaking, moving stones from large, uh, from great distances, really the whole thing is built out of the earth, out of stone and dirt and, and so forth, and, um, and placed, situated in the landscape in such a way that when I uh, take a photograph of it and I put it on the screen, in some ways I'm not doing, in a lot of ways I'm not doing justice to the thing. I'm d displacing it. For this thing to have meaning, it, it requires it to be in place. Um, uh, and that would certainly be true, I think, of Robert Morris. Other examples of Krauss's uh, category of site construction, simultaneously um, landscape and architecture at the same time. This is uh, Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels. This, uh, Nancy Holt is the wife of Robert Smithson, and so they uh, we're both artists working on their things independently, their work independently, but we're very much influencing each other, obviously, and collaborating to some extent. Um, uh, her sun tunnels, uh, there are four tunnels. Well, I mean, um, maybe I'll ask you, what do you see here? What is this work? Just on co a cold read. What do you see? What's going on here? It might not be a cold read for you, huh? <laughs> You're working on this, right, for your paper? I mean, what is the work? She has, she has uh, constructed some things here. What has she constructed? L looks to be f four massive concrete tubes or cylinders, hollow cylinders. And these cylinders are about nine feet tall on the outside, and about 18 feet long, I believe, yeah. And there are four of them, and they're set up in such a way that uh, they're, there's, they form an X. So you have two that face towards each other and two that face towards each other across a diagonal of about 86 feet, so it's pretty, it's pretty good size. Um, and they form an X. It's not a perfect like plus sign x, it's more of this kind of an x. Any guesses as to why it would be an x? 
I mean, if, it's, if it was perfect a plus sign kind of x, you might say, well, it's pointed towards the north, south, east, west. It's oriented in the landscape towards the landscape and towards the earth. And that would make sense. That would be uh, certainly suited to site construction, that its sense, its intelligibility is rooted in the space where it is, and it refers directly to the space that it's at. But what, what could an X be pointing at? <laughs> I, I suppose the hint is, is if we go back to um, Stonehenge, what was Stonehenge pointed towards or oriented towards, built to track? Track the sun, track the, uh, track the stars, there's quite a bit of um, writing done about exactly all that it did track, the moon, constellations, the thing was phenomenal. But the whole thing is oriented in the landscape to track the summer solstice, the rising of the sun on the longest day of the year, and then to uh, uh, also track its uh, shortest day of the year, the, the winter solstice. Um, Nancy Holt's sun tunnels do the same thing. They track, they point at the, um, the rising of the, uh, uh, the, what is it, the most northern and most southern uh, setting of the sun. Is that right? Yeah. Most northern and southern setting of the sun. So it's extremes of winter solstice and summer solstice. Uh, longest day of the year, shortest day of the year. So it is oriented, it's these objects that, I mean, in a lot of ways, the work is not so much the objects as it is the events, the phenomena that happen in, in seeing and paying attention to and tracking the movement of the sun, the movement of the earth in relation to the sun. Um, the work is there to get you to look at the landscape, I guess get you to look at, at, the, at the light. Um, and then we've got those holes that are bored in it or cast into it. Any ideas about what those holes are? They wrap around the outside of all of them. Yeah, they seem like constellations, and that's right, uh, that there are holes arranged in the uh, top of this so that uh, when you are inside of the tunnels and it casts dark in there because the sun is high, it casts dark, it creates these star um, constellations on the inside of these tunnels. And then at night, in theory, I suppose the thing s switches around and they, they correspond to constellations in the sky. And specifically, they, there's a, each tunnel has a different constellation on it. Um, constellation of Draco, Perseus, Columba, and Capricorn are the four constellations that she chooses. And I'm not entirely sure about the, her reason for choosing those four. That might be something for you to track down. Do you know? No, not yet. <laughs> uh, good, well, uh, keep looking for it. So what is she doing here? She says this, I wanted to bring the vast space of the desert back to human scale. I had no desire to make a megalithic monument. It's sort of interesting in the sense that, that uh, it is, I suppose, human scale. It's the constellations in, in, in a, a tube that is roughly suited for you to stand in look up and have a, 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 a recreation of a, a constellation, a starry sky, so to speak. Uh, and that these, these tubes then point you and orient you towards, through the expansive landscape here, towards the, the rising of the sun uh, at different times of the year. This is located in Utah. She spent uh, a lot of time looking for the correct site, the site that suited it best in New Mexico. She searched New Mexico and Arizona and eventually settled in Utah and purchased 40 acres in Utah in this fairly uh, desert, 
and deserted space. Uh, the closest town, I think, is like four miles away, and it's a very small town. It's in the middle of nowhere um, in this ancient kind of lake bed. And once again, we, we can see um, Krauss's definition, I think, of a, of a, cons a site construction simultaneously architecture and landscape. The architecture doesn't make any sense outside of the landscape. The architecture really just serves to point you towards the landscape. Um, in, in a way, the, the art work is once again the, the, the movement of the earth in relation to the sun. It's the light. Um, and she says that out, outright, that the idea of working with the actual projected light from the sun began to intrigue me. Her materials become the landscape and become the sunlight, not the concrete. The concrete is a way of capturing or orienting us towards the light and towards the landscape. There's an example of those constellations. What do you think? Any other readings you want to give to this? Ways of talking about it or questions? All right. Yeah. Yeah, good. That's a really great point. That I mean, American, lands American romantic landscape painting was really preoccupied with the Western landscape, the uninhabited, massive, vast landscape of the West um, in places like Utah. Uh, and that was, for the American landscape painting painters, the, the experience of the sublime the, the vast expanse that you can't control and that you can't really harness. You just find yourself within and kind of vulnerable to. And, and this does seem to be to connect up with that tradition in one way or another, huh? It, it wants us to pay attention to the vastness of the landscape and the, and the, the vastness of the solar system, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think it's, it's also on that uh, point worth noting that really to see this work, you can't just look at a photograph. You have to go out into the middle of nowhere to see this thing and to experience this thing. You have to make yourself vulnerable to that vast western landscape, to the heat, to the uh, lack of water and food and those sort of things, lack of a gas station. <laughs> uh, and you find yourself out in, out in the middle of the landscape, that vast Western landscape. Yeah, good. That in a way is, is not, I mean, uh, they were making paintings of it to sort of solicit that experience. Here, there's no picturing of it it just places you in it. Yeah. 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 Or, or maybe more, if not more forceful, because there's something, there's something awfully sort of generously inviting about this thing. Like, you can come out here. You, you, you can come out here. <laughs> it seems to be, like it doesn't so much beat you over the head as just, if you, if you go on a pilgrimage to this thing, you're sort of invited uh, to go on a pilgrimage to this thing. Um, if it's not more forceful, which you could, I think, argue, it's at least more, what is the right word? Committed, more, more enveloping, more uh, absorbing. You're absorbed into it in the way that in a way you're not absorbed into a landscape painting. Or if you are absorbed into it, you're absorbed mentally or visually, but not, you, you view it from a safe distance, from a safe position. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, yeah.
to do it and the, the, the landscape turned this sudden to, to, to start in this perspective, right? Ah, oh, yeah, in the way that it's cut out into a circle. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You do kind of see it as a, I mean, <laughs> really, you, in, this, in this particular picture anyway, you do see it as an earth with the stars surrounding the earth, huh? Uh, and I suppose that could also flip around into being the, uh, the sun, it's forming the sun. <laughs> I had never thought, I, I had never looked at this picture long enough to think that. <laughs> it's, that's kind of wonderful. Um, duh. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, good. And I mean, sun, sun tunnels also in the sense that it is orienting itself towards the sun. I evidently, I'm, I, I've read that when, when, you're in these tunnels during summer solstice, during the sunrise, it's just, you're straight on, and it just lights up, the whole tube just becomes orange, because it's, it's lined up directly. And so it illuminates the whole inside of the tube uh, for, uh, for a short period of time. Um, so it's certainly a sun tunnel in the sense that it's oriented towards the sun on the longest, shortest days of the year, the sunrise for each of them but also sun tunnel in the way that it is uh, harnessing the sun and turning it into stars or turning it into constellations. Yeah, good. And perhaps the way that it cuts out a circle uh, in the form of the sun. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone want to elaborate on that? Take that and run with it? I think also just the idea of a pilgrimage that you have to go and conquer this really specific journey and it's like a also kind of blend this idea that it is that you're going to have this special experience. Yeah. Yeah, good. There do there do seem to be some some uh, religious associations with this, huh? theological associations at, at any rate. That, there, that whole pilgrimage language um, is there, that you've come to visit it, and when you get there, what you've come to visit is not architecture in the sense of providing a shelter or even a, um, a, a, a home or something like that, but it provides you with and a reorientation, um, and maybe even a, I mean, in the language of, the, of Stonehenge, most likely Stonehenge had religious rituals attached to it. There's something about the function of this thing that is reorienting and not shelter. It doesn't provide shelter. That does seem to lend itself towards the sort of sacred space reading, right? Because what else is it for? Uh, it doesn't seem to be fully a scientific, you know, it's not hard science. Like scientists don't go out here to, ex to look at the sunrise on these days of the year. Um, you don't go here to get shelter or food or anything else. What are you going for? You seem to be going there to be reoriented. And that it does have sort of sacred space implications to it, I think. Yeah. I mean, does that, does that do justice to what you two were saying? <laughs> sort of. Or I put it in my own words entirely. It's unrecognizable. Well, good. I, I mean, I, I, think that's, I think that's certainly there. Um, okay, moving on. We'll look at a few other site constructions and then proceed on with uh, Krauss's categories here. Um, 
And, and these are a few selections. We could obviously find lots more examples, but these seem to be well-known and poignant examples. Uh, this is Maya Lin's uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., in the, in the, the uh, Capitol Mall area, that long strip that extends away from the Capitol building. Have any of you been to this monument? Yeah, good. I think that'll help. Uh, so this is a monument um, dedicated to Vietnam. And what's interesting about this monument? How is this different than most monuments that you're aware of, and certainly most monuments on the Capitol Mall? What do most of those monuments look like? Yeah, good, good hand motion. This. <laughs> they, they go upward from the earth, right? We tend to construct monuments to go upward, to point at the sky. Um, and I think that has ancient uh, reasons for it. But we build upward. We set things up. We build grand structures as monuments, sometimes including grand figures like the, the monument of Abraham Lincoln that's on the mall and so on. Whereas, what does this monument do? Yeah, it cuts into the ground. The whole thing is a big gouge in the earth rather than building up from the earth. Um, and that's a pretty powerful idea for a monument, a war monument, a scar in the earth, a gouge in the earth. So you build the monument not by constructing upwards, but by digging into, uh, wounding the earth in, in a way. If you visit it, there are sort of two ways to approach the thing, um, though this is probably the, the primary way uh, it was meant to be entered. Um, and as you enter it, uh, there is polished, uh, really dark, almost black marble um, that runs the whole course of this gouge. So it digs down into the earth. And as you enter it, uh, it gradually gets deeper or taller. And what's written on, the, on this polished marble are names names of all the people who uh, died in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, and they run chronologically so that when you, when you enter this, you have a lot of names uh, that you meet here at the beginning of the conflict. You have a lot of names, but as you move forward in the years, you have a lot more names and a lot more names. And as you proceed through the years, you're walking sort of through the years of, of the, the Vietnam War, the Vietnam conflict. And as you walk through the years, you eventually find yourself buried, <laughs> right? I mean, you go into these, uh, you go down into the earth and you, you find yourself buried with all of these names, confronting these names. And the marble is polished in such a way that uh, it becomes highly reflective so that commingling with all of these names of the dead are the, the images of the living. You find yourself reflected in, in those names, right? So even when you look at this picture, um, uh, it, you get this quite, uh, quite a bit of oscillation between the names and the images, and then as it becomes more kind of oblique, uh, it becomes all image. It becomes a sort of mirror of, the, of current situations or of current living people. It's a haunting. It's a haunting image. <laughs> uh, image. Monument. Is it a monument? It's a haunting work. And it certainly is interesting in the context of Krauss's uh, discussion about site construction, where this very much is part of the landscape and very much is an architectural structure, co sort of commingled, uh, wound together, um, dependent on each other in, in a way that's unlike maybe this building that's setting on the landscape. This is sort of you can't have these walls without the landscape and, and so on. Um, 
And Maya Lin would, uh, this is, I, I think her, she did this when she was very young. I mean, she was in her uh, early 20s when she proposed this. She was uh, uh, an MFA student, or I, I don't even know if she was an MFA student. She may have been an undergrad at the time at Yale, I believe it was. So she was an art student at Yale and proposed this. They had this national competition to design the Vietnam uh, War Memorial. And uh, she proposed it and ended up winning it over lots of other formidable competitors. <laughs> and, uh, and this is sort of her first really major work. And since then, she has gone on to be a fascinating artist, a, a contemporary artist who shows in galleries and museums um, all over the place and continues to do site-specific constructions like this. Um, uh, some of her, her installation work looks like this. It's, it's almost always the landscape and structures wound up with each other. So objects taken from the landscape, shaped into objects that we use to construct homes and buildings, and then here used to construct another landscape uh, in a way. Uh, and a lot of her, a lot of her work is, is like that. Yeah, Dano, did you have a question? Yeah, so the Vietnam War Memorial, as it gets deeper, um, kind of resembles the cabinet piece for here that happened overseas um, in 67 to 71 and 72. Progressively, it just gets larger. Yeah. I think the, the worst year was 68 or 2000. Yeah. So the next couple of intervals going through the war. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Um, I don't remember. I, I believe it does, but I don't remember. I, I mean, I've been there, but I don't, I don't remember if, if they have it divided up into years. For some reason, I, I want to say that it is, uh, but I don't know if that's because I knew what, I knew what it was and then showed, showed up there, and so I was like, oh, we're in 1968, <laughs> you know. Oh, uh, when you're in the deepest, when you're in the corner, um, you're, I think 69 maybe is what it is. And I don't remember if that was, if I remember thinking that because it, it was actually labeled or I just had imported that. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other ways you want to read this or interpret this? Any, any other ways we can make sense of it? Yeah. It really reminds me of like the trenches. You know? Ah, that's nice. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable in the way that it has those associations that are all different and all meaningful. Like that, it, it is they are. It is the digging of trenches. It is the wounding of the landscape, and it's it <laughs> certainly possible to argue that the Vietnam War wounded the landscape um, uh, uh, pretty severely. Uh, so it's a, it's a gouge in the landscape, a wound in the landscape. It is a burial. It is a, it is a, uh, a grave site. And a, a sort of all of those things are bound together in this digging downward as a monument, a monument that digs downward. Yeah? In the corner, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think I have it in my notes, but it is well overhead. I mean, it's, it's probably a good, uh, I would say nine feet. Those of you who've been there, when you're when you're all the way in the corner, I mean you get you get some. Let's see if I can get my arrow here. You get some idea. Like this is a big bouquet of flowers. These are people right here. Um, I mean, it's. I, I'll bet it. I'll bet it's a good. We'll say ten feet. I mean, it's it's. It, you are overwhelmed by. Uh, how many names are listed uh, as, as you're standing there and how it goes overhead. And once you, once you get to that place, um, all you can see are these names and the reflections. You can't see the landscape anymore. Uh, you really are buried. You, you can't look out. There's no great view, grand view, uh, like you can get from some of the other monuments. Yeah.
Oh, yeah, yeah, that's nice, is it? So you have the Washington Monument that is sort of the, the Egyptian obelisk. Uh, it's, I guess, the antithesis of this uh, structurally speaking. Yeah. And granted, uh, making a monument to Washington is a very different reason than making a monument to remember the, those who died in war. So, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's are totally different subject matter, subject matter, matters, um, uh, that I think determine and are very appropriate to the difference in structure. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, in the eighties, uh, wall. If you met, if <laughs> if there are any associations between walls and politics, you go immediately to. The, the Iron Curtain, the, 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 the Berlin Wall especially, the, the communist building walls to separate themselves off from the Western world. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That's nice. You ha you do that. I, it had never occurred to me before that she didn't just leave this ramp open. I mean, the 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 hill, um, like that. All of this, where am I? Here, all of this. You can't really. I mean, maybe it, maybe initially it was like that, but you can't walk over here right now. I don't think it. It pretty much funnels you. Uh, with these, uh, uh, with the walkway and with this fence, you have to kind of march as a group down into this thing. You can't just stand far off from it, and you can't sort of utilize this field. That's interesting. It never occurred to me before. That's good. And maybe that is part of that forced burial in a way, or forced forcing you not to take in the whole thing at once, but you have to pass all the way through the war, in a way. You have to go all the way past all of the names um, and, and through all of those years. Yeah, good. It is chronological. Yeah, I know it's chronological, but I'm not sure if, it's, if it is uh, listed, like if it tells you what year you're in. Yeah, but yeah, good. Okay, uh, so check out Maya Lin, she's fascinating, especially on this topic of um, the landscape and the artwork, the landscape and the architecture. Okay, let's, uh, let's try to sort out uh, um, what the rest of the time we have this morning and then this afternoon, Krauss's other two designations of how this field uh, the sculptural field can be occupied and practiced within. So we've been talking about the site construction, that which is simultaneously landscape and architecture. Uh, for now, let's, let's try to sort out what, it, what a marked site is. What does she mean by a marked site? That which is simultaneously landscape and not landscape. What would that look like? And one thing that might look like is this. <laughs> This is Robert Smithson, once again, and this is the work he's probably most well known for. And um, this is called Spiral Jetty. And in what way is this landscape and not landscape? What does she mean by that? How is this part of the field, the expanded field, uh, occupied? What, what is it? Yeah. 
Yeah, good, good, good. So it's, it's not architecture, doesn't have really anything to do with architecture. It is totally landscape in the sense that it's all natural materials. Nothing has been uh, brought here from the outside other than the equipment to move it around. Uh, but the materials are the landscape, but it's not the landscape at the same time. Uh, it, it, the landscape has been altered or marked, as uh, Krauss says. This is a marked site, an altered site. This also is in Utah. It's in uh, the Great Salt Lake, um, and it's on a fairly remote side of the lake. So uh, it, like all of these earthworks, for the most part, is really difficult to get to. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> uh, let's see if I have any uh, uh, um, numbers in my notes. I don't think I do, but I'll show you some pictures that give you an idea of it. I mean, the, this was made using, uh, using dump trucks, so it's wide enough, it's a wide enough as a road for dump trucks to back all the way around. So it's big, yeah, it's really big. It's 15 feet wide. Good, thank you. <laughs> this is so helpful, technology is very helpful in a lot of ways, isn't it? You just keep the facts coming, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and it interrupts the, the lake in a lot of ways. As you can see here, because, of, because it's a jetty and all jetties are built to interrupt the flow and to create certain quarters that have uh, waves and those that don't and so on, um, and to, to split the surface of the water, the depth of the water. Um, it does, it does do that, uh, pres producing these different colors for whatever, and producing some fairly stagnant areas in the inside of the spiral that often turn red, as is here. The Salt Lake has a really high uh, content of these, uh, it's a bacteria, kind of bacteria, I don't remember off the top of my head, that turns the, the water red occasionally, uh, kind of periodically and it's beginning to uh, turn it red here. Um, and so why the spiral? Uh, we'll, we'll try to sort through this thing a little bit. Why the spiral? I mean, what associations do you have with spirals? Yeah. I feel like it's almost passive. The spirals tend to be really fun in nature as well. Yeah. So I think it's a good way to try to immediately immediately affect it, but it's like you would see that shape within plants, within uh, designs on scales or buildings. Good, 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 good. So you find it all over in nature, plants, animals, also in water, whirlpools, and so on. Good. What else, what other associations do you have with the spiral? Yeah. Uh, is it made with like the golden section of the ocean? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the same spiral. It's not a golden spiral, um, which would be really interesting. I think, you know, uh, I don't, yeah, it's not. But that would be really great if it was. <laughs> uh, but good question. At any rate, the golden spiral suggests this order uh, in the world, an order to uh, uh, various forms, the, the uh, Milky Way, the, all sorts of things. So it's an order that's in the world. But it also, all spirals seem to suggest an infinite an infinite expansion and contraction in both directions, right? So that spirals uh, suggest an infinite openness because they could just, in theory, continue to unspiral, and an infinite uh, microcosm. So an infinite macrocosm, an infinite microcosm, in that they could, in theory, continue to spiral in forever. And there's this idea, I think, in all spirals, and maybe is operative here, of this kind of an, an infinite expanse, an infinite regress and an infinite progress, in a way, uh, that seems to be bound up in the, in the spiral. And that spiral, maybe with those illusions there, sort of juts itself out into, offers itself out, no matter how massive it is, it is engulfed uh, and just dwarfed by the expanse of the Great Salt Lake. 
And I'll read you some of what Smithson wrote about this. Um, we'll get some of his sense of what he's doing. As I looked at the site, and he also spent a lot of time searching for where this goes and searching for sites to make work. So I don't think that he showed up with a preconceived idea of what he was going to make, but he was searching for sites that were appropriate for making work. And then he shows up in this work, and this is what his experience was. As I looked at the site, it reverberated out to the horizons, only to suggest an immobile cyclone, while flickering light made the entire landscape appear to quake. A dormant earthquake spread into the fluttering stillness, into a spinning sensation without movement. And you see how he's putting these things. A dormant earthquake, uh, a, uh, an immobile cyclone, uh, what is it, a fluttering stillness, and so on. A spinning sensation without movement. He's putting these paradoxes together. This site was a rotary that enclosed itself in an immense roundness. From that gyrating space emerged the possibility of the spiral jetty. My dialectics of sight and non-sight whirled into an indeterminate state where solid and liquid lost themselves in each other, matter collapsing into the lake, mirrored in the shape of a spiral. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's pretty esoteric and poetic. The language is inflated in a lot of ways. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you do get the sense, uh, I mean, and I think that's important, that this is essentially for him, I think, a poetic action, um, that he makes the work as a sort of uh, 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 an offering to this idea of, of immobile movement. And, and as you read Smithson more and hear interviews with him or whatever, it's mostly written, um, he talks a lot about those sort of things, these, these um, uh, what, this contrast or paradox between that which seems to be stable and that which is chaotic at the same time, or that which seems to be immobile and timeless and that which is degrading at the same time. So he talks a lot about entropy, right? The, that this seems very sort of timeless in its expanse, but everything is breaking down in one way or another and is moving towards en entropy and change. And he, like I think the buried woodshed, creates this thing and then it is intended to suggest its own kind of movement in time, its own participation in time. Um, and that could happen over, over long periods of time. I mean, after all, the current expanse of the Salt Lake is not what it used to be. The Salt Lake used to cover large portions of Utah and is now, uh, it's still a gigantic lake, but it's much smaller. Um, so as this goes, as this changes, what happens to this thing? Will the, will the lake expand again and cover it? Will the lake shrink again and leave it sort of naked and revealed? At certain points, it does change back and forth. Uh, that at points, it dried up and was just left uh, sort of naked, as I called it, with these rocks. Um, and this is a, a, a look down the, down the jetty. And at other times, it has been flooded over and uh, sort of disappears. And because it's the Great Salt Lake, these stones collect salt and they gradually turn white and turn into these sort of large salty chunks. And then the water turns red. I mean, it's a crazy, <laughs> it's a crazy sight. And it thoroughly belongs to that site. It is the landscape. It comes from the landscape and it is always embedded in the landscape. Um, and yet uh, is somehow not the landscape or more than landscape, altered in order to 
uh, get us to look at the landscape different and look at, at this space and this site differently. And then it dries up again and so on. Um, let me show you just a, a couple more, uh, what do we call these, marked sites, and then we'll, we'll break for lunch. Another one of the uh, prominent earthworks artists, and we're going to start call, referring to these artists as earthworks, these works as either earthworks or sometimes they're called land art. Um, another one is Mar Michael Heitzer. And this one's called double negative, and they are these two massive notches on either side of this uh, canyon. And I mean, these notches are like 60 feet long, 30 feet deep, so there are these massive notches. And what do you do as you're looking at this thing? What is the work? How do you experience this thing? You connect two ends. You connect two ends, yeah. So in, in a way, what he has made are these massive notches, these massive removals of the earth that just flows down the uh, hill. Um, but the way that we read it is the possibility of some sort of supportive beam that connects them, uh, that we see it as connected. Um, without imposing anything on the landscape, we kind of imaginatively or visually um, connect it, make sense of it, impose a, a form on the, uh, in, in the space, on the space. So it's a double negative and the positive, it, that, that suggests a positive that it, it takes up that space, fills in that negative. Uh, Heitzer says this about it, there is nothing there, <laughs> yet it is still a sculpture. So he'll refer to these as sculpture, but uh, there's, there's quite literally, n it has been made by removal, uh, removal of the earth, removal of space, making space that wasn't there before it is a kind of way of making sculpture. Um, and that fits pretty, pretty nicely within uh, Krauss's definition of a marked site. There you get a sense of scale. They're big, big holes, <laughs> notches, negatives. Sculpture as, or negation as sculpture. And at any rate, however you unpack that uh, and, and interpret it, because I think there are a lot of things we could do with that, a double negative has lots of associations. But at any rate, at sort of the base level, what you have are people working sculpturally and referring to these things as sculptures, but obviously experimenting with a really broad field of what sculpture is, what sculptural work is. Can I make a sculpture through negation and removal? Is that still a sculpture? And if so, how, how, do, how do I do it? How does it, how does it function as a as a as a sculpture? Does it have to be monumental in this way? Does it have to, once again, uh, demand that I go out into the middle of nowhere? I mean, that's an important part of all of these, is that they are explicitly anti-museum and anti-gallery. There is nothing, there's, uh, you can't go, uh, you can't reproduce them, you can't go and see them, you can't ship them. I mean, you can go and see them but you can't go to the museum to see them. You can't ship them, you can't trade them, you can't buy or sell them. There's no commodity here. There's no art object here. Um, and, uh, and that is really important to all of these artists to specifically reject the way that the traditional art world has been functioning on all of those points. And they're, they're pretty strategic in the way that they're doing it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, so you have to travel to each, what's the difference in the travel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, that's right. You go to have an intentional experience. 
Any, any ideas how the difference between this and a, a museum and the, the way that we travel to them or the way we experience them? I mean, it's, yeah. Well, I guess museums are in, in cities. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, and that's. Yeah. 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 Ah, uh, uh, that's fascinating, and I think those two go together. That museums only function in <laughs> cities; they can only happen in cities. I mean, you can have a museum out in the middle of nowhere, but it's not going to do anything. It is totally reliant on the economic and cultural systems of a city and an urban space. But as you pointed out, they're specifically designed to create these spaces that are disjointed from the city in a way, uh, that they, they operate as a sort of vacuum that can present the work in, in a neutral space that's not cluttered with the city. And I think that's one thing that when we looked at Rauschenberg, that's what Rauschenberg did, was reintroduce the clutter of the city back into the gallery and into the museum. Um, uh, so in a sense, it's, only de it's dependent on the city, but removed from the city, here, um, I, I think you're right to say that it's, you ha it's remote. All of these sites are remote and they have to be remote. You have to journey out to them. You have to sort of make yourself vulnerable to the landscape and to the journey and it's really laborious to get there. Um, but once you're there, you find yourself integrated into the space. There's no sectioning off in a way. It's just continuous landscape that you find yourself in with alterations in the landscape to get you thinking about the landscape differently. And yeah, good. Yeah. It's also just being in this environment where you can kind of see <coughs> the art piece itself is at the mercy of the environment. Whereas in a uh, museum, it's closer to uh, the ground where this is permanent and things you, li things you live in it and you live in the artwork are at the mercy of nature. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's nice. That's good. Yeah, good. And that, I think, we get a lot of uh, sort of um, I influence from minimalism here, right? They're pretty minimalist forms, always. A fairly simple spiral, a simple kind of minimalist. I mean, really, the form that you imagine here is a gigantic minimalist sculpture, <laughs> right? A, a, a rectangular box. So there's lots of uh, sort of influences from minimalism, but minimalism was so preoccupied with timeless materials, steel, um, resin, things like that, that were machined and industrialized and don't age and show no signs of age. Um, whereas this time is front and center in the work. Long periods of time, this thing enduring over long periods of time and subjected to nature and all of those things. It, it's taking, it's taking a, a, a dash of conceptualism, a dash of minimalism, and trying to resituate it in the landscape when, in ways that make us feel small in the span of the space and small in the span of the time. I'm, is that sort of uh, related to what you were saying? Yeah, good. Um, okay, we'll uh, pick this up and we'll continue uh, after lunch. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.